get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like uh, the founders of RX Bars, and they end up selling a Kellogg for $600 million, but we talked about early on how they built it from scratch and bootstrapped it, and P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime. Like, that's actually how he made food and rent money, Richard. He would put his hat onto the street and do street miming, and that's how he made his his rent, and... um, before he obviously sold hundreds of millions of dollars in P90X. Uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about how when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. That's a, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big miss. Um, so this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And what we do is create a systemized incoming referral pipeline, which generates ROI using a podcast. And for me, um, podcasting is one of the best things I've done for my business and my life, but it's much more personal um, because it's not just about your business. In my mind, it's about leaving a legacy for yourself and your guests. And it was inspired, and Richard, you relate to this, um, by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, were the only members of their family to survive. And his words and legacy live on because of the interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him, which you can watch on my About page. And it's really inspired me, and I watch it at least twice a year um, to, to hear about it. And that wouldn't be possible if they didn't do the interview. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy. And you can check it out. Check us out at rise25.com if you have questions. Um, you, know, you can email us, support at rise25media.com, where we handle 99% of all the work behind the scenes and the strategy. So I am super excited uh, about today's guest, Richard Rossi. Um, he's co-founder of two of the world's largest and most prestigious enrichment programs for high-achieving students, uh, Da Vinci Education, davinci.com. In 1986, he co-founded Envision EMI, which grew into the country's largest provider of live leadership and career exploration programs for high-achieving students. They had 50,000 students a year attended, in attendance with over 200 staff and annual revenues exceeding $120 million, and they sold Envision EMI in 2011. He didn't go and sit on a beach what he did was he went and started another business. And in 2013, he started a business that now fills stadiums with parents and students. And if you want to think about it and visualize it, think of, visualize a stadium with tens of thousands of people. Think TED Talk meets Tony Robbins meets rock concert. And they put the biggest names in the world on the stage in the STEM fields. I'm hoping to take my daughters to this and when they're old enough. And they create a magical experience where high achievers, kid, high achieving kids come and they find their tribe. You know, the people that they've been looking for, you know, you know people who are high achievers are, you know, a little bit different you know, um, and they find in a positive way and they find the other people exactly like them. So in the past few decades, more than 640,000 students from more than uh, 118 countries collectively have attended these academic programs. You know, it's, Richard, it's amazing the impact that you've had and your companies have had. And um, also, if that wasn't enough, he's also created the highest level mastermind in the world for biohacking maximum health and radical life extension. He's assembled a rock star group of advisors and faculty at the da Vinci 50.com. That's five zero.com. And some of the people he's assembled are amazing. Like George church, professor of genetics at Harvard, Bill Falloon. He's a leading researcher for life extension, longevity, Dave Asprey, Dr. Mercola, Rhonda Patrick, and so many more. Richard, I mean, you, you deserve that, intro and I wanted to say every last word of it. So thank you for joining me. Oh, so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. 
Um, I wanted to start with, with the journey. Um, and, you know, we will find out. I just want to tease a little bit because I personally want to know what you do, what you've done as far as your health and longevity and what you've seen in the research. So we will dive into those and what you've done personally and what you recommend. Um, but I want to start off with the journey and it kind of starts with your parents. They were immigrants. They escaped World War II. And having you talk about your mom's journey and influence a little bit. Well, it was uh, extremely profound. They both were uh, Jews escaping Hitler and uh, my mom from Austria, my dad from Italy. They immigrated to the U.S. in the um, in the 1940s, got married, had me 13 years later. They separated when I was in the third grade and um, I lived in the, one of the richest towns in America, and I was one of the poorest kids in that town. We really had almost nothing, but I had a mom who loved me and was 100% committed to me, maybe 200% committed to me, and made sure that even though she had little to nothing, I had everything. I got to go on skiing trips, and I got to mm. go do sailing lessons, and I got to feel just like a regular kid in, mm. uh, in the school system there in Greenwich, Connecticut. But it taught me a lot about sacrifice. Um, I, I really was, in every sense of the word, uh, the, the sole focus of her life. Mm. What did she do? Well, she really was just, she, she was a mom. Uh, mm -hmm. But before uh, that, she was a, an artist, a graphic artist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when she came to the U.S. and got married, the, she really became just, um, just a great mom. And I hate to say the word mom, because just mom, because every mother is a working mother. Um, and it's, it's like uh, the hardest job. I mean, well, the multitasking involved is insane. <laughs> so. and, it, and it is uh, it is an incredibly noble profession so um she really we, we relied on the little money that we got from my dad every month and uh we just soldiered through and then uh went together to washington dc when it was time for college yeah what were some of the things that you learned from her um because i know that she's a big you know inspiration to you well, you know, I learned positive and negative things. Um, on, on the positive side, um, I, I learned about the power of love uh, mm -hmm. and commitment. And there was no question. It was total. It was absolute. There was incredible sacrifice every day. Uh, there were so many things that she could have done with the paucity of money that we had. But instead, she decided it was all going to go to me. I was it. I was her hope. I was her inspiration. I was her focus. Um, and that was amazing. I also learned later in life when I reflected upon it about the, the, the power of um, survival because her parents died, her sister died, her aunt died. Uh, she was devastated. She never recovered. And mm. as I thought about it later in life, I realized she probably never went through a day without suffering. She didn't really make that super obvious to me, but um, death and suffering were always in the picture with her. And I think in a lot of ways, she just kind of white knuckled her way through uh, mm. life. This is, there's some people that because of their psychological makeup, they can get over it and they can live a great life. And there's some people that just can't get over it. And she just was one of those people that was knocked to the ground and couldn't totally get up afterwards. But mm. she certainly did everything to be a great mom. Yeah, it seemed like she put on a strong um, facade for you. Um, no matter what, right? No doubt. And, yeah. and on the negative side is also, I think, the, the, it was kind of the same thing, which was I was the total focus. I was uh, the person that she was thinking about working with and, and um, in a sense, uh, directing every day. And that was suffocating. Right. So, and, 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 and what I learned as a kid was how do I work around that? How can I be a normal kid, have my friends, go out, have a drink every once in a while, do some things that are naughty um, without disappointing her? So, mm. I, I a lot of pressure. Learned, yeah, enormous, enormous pressure. And it wasn't even hidden. It was like, okay, Richard, I'm alive because of, for you, it's the only reason I'm alive. I'm like, oh, great. So, but no pressure it, there. What I, yeah, right, Jewish mom. But what I learned was, um, <laughs> how to kind of just get around that. And with my own kids, uh, it taught me a lot about, uh, you know, when to hold, when to fold, when to push, when to hold back, um, and how much to get involved and how much to allow mm -hmm. them to make their own decisions and mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's one story that sticks out to me that you have told about 
your mom's um, candlestick holders, which I think well, kind of demonstrate this whole, what exactly what you're saying. Yeah, there's really nothing that demonstrates it as well as that. So as I mentioned, we were super poor, super, super, super poor. And one of the things that I wanted to do is play in the school band. I wanted to play the flute. Um, but that was there was no money for a flute, period. So she took the only thing that she had left from her parents, which was a set of silver candlesticks, took the train into New York City, went to a pawn shop and pawned them so that we could have enough money to rent not to buy, but to rent a flute. Yes. And every month she would take the train in New York to pay the interest so that they wouldn't sell those candlesticks. And I got to play the flute. I was mm. never very good, but I got to play it. And it was just another thing that I wanted to do to be a real regular kid. And she made every sacrifice to make it happen. And she eventually recovered those, those candlesticks mm. and, and they're down in my living room, or mm. my dining room right now. Mm. But that's a real microcosm of my mother for sure. That's but amazing. It was a, in a lot of ways, she lived a very tragic life because, um, when when something like World War II hits, when you lose your entire family, um, there are consequences, and and they they were with her the rest of her life. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. Right? At uh, how old was she when she came over? She was to, in her early twenties. Yeah, twenties, just uprooting, leaving your whole family, and leaving them behind, and then never seeing them again. You know, it's just. Well, there's also survivor's guilt, right? So she tried to get them to come with her, and they wouldn't. They, it was the classic thing. If you read about World War II, people stayed behind because they thought it wasn't going to get worse, and they mm. had no idea how much worse it actually was going to get. By the time they realized it, they couldn't get out. Yeah, I think, you know, Richard, one of the, I mean, inspirations for your eventual business, um, helping the high-achieving students, was from your mom, right? Oh, absolutely. No question about it, because she, well... Look, she died when I was 24 years old and only a few miles from here. And I was sitting by her bedside when she died. And before she died, we had a, a conversation where I said, tell me what you want from me. You have sacrificed everything. What do you want? Uh, and she said, well, I want you to help people. And I thought, oh, this is going to be that hard. And you know, I could be a doctor. I could be a social worker or whatever. And she said, no, 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 no. I want you to help people. And at that moment, I realized she was actually referring to humanity. And I remember so clearly, Jeremy, thinking at that moment, uh, well, that's never going to happen. And yet, uh, as time has gone on, I really feel like I have uh, had an impact and that she would be proud of me. So, Richard, I mean, I want to hear, uh, hopefully everyone wants to hear, what do you do now, um, you know, in your everyday life? Um, or have you done that you've experimented with that you found you know, has worked for you. Obviously, you can only speak from your own right. experience. So, well, again, I want to emphasize that I'm I'm not the poster boy. I'm not the role model. Mm -hmm. I, well, that's I'm, why I want you to talk, right? Because okay, it's yeah. more of a reality. It's like you don't. You're not waking up at like you know four in the green morning wine, drinking yeah. green juice every day necessarily. But you also look at the since you you said I'm quote a lazy. Like I actually want to hear from a quote. You know, I don't think you're lazy, but a lazy person's version because they're going to find shortcuts, you know? Well, that, my friend, is what I'm always looking for is the shortcuts. So right. I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, and, and, and boy, there's so many, but here's some, here, here we go. Yeah. Um, so I, when it comes to exercise, I want maximum results in minimum time and minimum effort. So a couple of examples would be a machine called the Vasper machine, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's basically an aerobic piece of aerobic equipment. It adds um, pressure to the legs and the arms along with cooling and creates an effect um, within the body where 20 minutes of moderate exercise uh, is the equivalent of an hour, an hour and a half, two hours of hmm intense exercise mm -hmm. and they will give you a book full of the evidence and the sport teams that they've tested this on and so on and so forth. I'm convinced it's the real deal. A lot of our mutual friends have them. Um, and I use one every day that I'm in DC. Another great example is something called Katsu, which is K-A-A-T-S-U. And these are bands that uh, go around your arms and, and go around your legs, though not at the same time, and then inflate uh, using a, 
a piece of equipment that does this to a very scientific level. Long story short, it allows you to use very light weights, um, but the effect on your muscles is as if you were using very heavy weights. Um, so you could use a five or 10 pound weight, but your body thinks you're using a 40 or 50 pound weight. Uh, and, and it puts less uh, stress on the joints. It's got a lot of, that sounds, yeah, that's like a critical, lot of positive right? effects. Yeah. No, no question. And bodybuilders have been using stuff like this for decades, but very crude and very dangerous versions of this. This is safe. It's extremely well thought through. Um, and I, I highly recommend that as well. As far as straight drugs are concerned, I think the one that is by far the most promising is called metformin. Um, and metformin is a drug that was uh, first developed 50 years ago for type 2 diabetics. Um, and um, it, um, it just it controls the blood glucose level, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it turns out it has some pretty amazing anti-aging properties. And it is the first... Uh, FDA approved trial, which is going on now, hmm. for um, a anti-aging drug. The first time the FDA has ever acknowledged aging as possibly as a disease. Hmm. So um, uh, the the people that are really into this have been using metformin for some for decades. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. But what it does in ex in essence is it simulates um, calorie restriction. Um, and it shuts down something called the mTOR pathway. Uh, and because of that, all kinds of amazing things happen in terms of um, resistance to cancer and so on and so forth. And again, I want to emphasize, this is an old line drug, costs 20 bucks a month, has a tremendous success record uh, and safety record. So that's something that I would uh, put in, is like I would call like the first anti-aging drug. But mm -hmm. there are others that are coming behind it in the very, very near future. Um, the third thing I would talk about would be stem cells. So um, there are stem cells that can be taken from your own body, either your body fat or your bone, but there are also stem cells that can be taken from um, an umbilical cord on day zero, um, which have dramatic properties to them. And if you go overseas, or I shouldn't say overseas, out of this country, to Mexico, to Colombia, to uh, Panama, you can go to very reputable places that actually have the ability to, uh, to multiply those stem cells. That's not legal in this country yet. Um, and as a result, you can get a, uh, an, in an injection or an IV with millions and millions of stem cells which go around the body, um, healing and reducing inflammation. And as we know, uh, chronic inflammation, big, big cause of aging and, and disease. So huge believer in, in, uh, in stem cells. In the ideal Again, world, Richard, money is no object. Um, what, what do you think the experts recommend? How often should someone get stem cells and where should they get stem cells? Just, just for health purposes, not saying, okay, like you have a back problem, they inject it in the back or a knee problem, they inject it in the knee. If you're pretty right. healthy, what, is there a recommendation out there? Like, yeah, you should get IV say, stem cells every six months or something? I don't know. The most aggressive that I've heard is every six months. Um, six every year is reasonable. Some people would say every two years. There isn't um, a ton of um, uh, track record on this. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I really want to emphasize to your listeners is, and there are going to be people who say, well, you know, this is all very interesting, but we're not going to know whether you actually lived longer until years down the road. So this could all just be hocus pocus. And what's really, really interesting is we've now developed a way, uh, which is mainstream science, you know, mainstream science, to actually measure your biological age hmm. as opposed to your chronological age. It's called your epigenetic age. Mm. Um, and that means that Jeremy, you know, could be 45 uh, chronologically, but could be 55 biologically or 35 biologically. And really, that's what matters. It's not your chronological age, your biological age. So if you're taking substances and you're, uh, you're in activities and you can then see that your biological mm. age is going down, that's hard evidence that good things are happening in your body. 
mm. good things are happening in your body. Talk about Richard. So tests, tests people should do. And you know, we talked about there's a calcium test, you know, that you can get, you know, uh, what are the tests you recommend uh, or that you've had? Right. Um, Cause I like, you know, obviously we can't recommend, but people can do their own research and do their own due diligence. But what have you done for yourself that um, I want you to recommend to me? <laughs> so. Well, I think one of the most important things is like bad news today is so much better than bad news tomorrow. Right. So what you want to get information uh, at, at the earliest possible stage, if you have a problem, the very earliest possible stage, people talk about like pancreatic cancer being a death sentence. It actually isn't a death sentence. The reason it's a death sentence is because it's never discovered until stage four because there's no symptoms. But were you to discover it in stage one, you could be completely cured of pancreatic cancer, right? So um, a couple of things to that. First of all, I do a full body MRI um, every couple of years. Now, remember, MRI has no uh, radiation whatsoever. And to the best of our knowledge, it has no negative impacts on the body. I don't, th this is done without contrast. But it allows the, them to take a look at me, you know, top of my head to the bottom of my toes and say, is there any cancer in there? Are there any tumors in there? Is there anything going on in there? Uh, and then they do a separate scan of my heart, uh, a separate MRI just of my heart, um, which is also very, very good. So uh, that's one of the, mm -hmm. the, my primary detection methods. Yeah. And, and the other is that calcium score. And I just want to explain what that is because President Trump just had one, business executives have it all the time, and yet you'll never hear a typical doctor talk about it or recommend it. It's basically a, a specialized kind of scan, like a CAT scan, that allows them to look at your arteries and tell well, how much plaque is there in there. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. And it gives you a score between zero and like 4,000. And zero means you have no heart disease. Up to 100 means you have um, a very tiny amount of heart disease, a tiny amount of lacking. And then it goes up and up and up to 1,000, which is oh my God time, at which point you would immediately want to go in and have like an angiogram and maybe have stents put in. The idea is to know this before you have the heart attack, right? So it's like, oh, he had 90, you know, he had 90 per, 90 percent blocked, and then he had a heart attack. That's what if we could people, find that, right. right? That's the the first sign of heart attack is very often death. So the idea of being able to do this every few years and go, oh, you know what? I'm at zero. Well, Richard, you know your your cholesterol is a little high. We should give you a statin. No, no, you didn't hear me. It's at zero. I'm not taking a statin. Right. So it allows you to actually get a degree of insight, along with many, many, many super sophisticated blood tests, uh, liquid uh, cancer screening through blood tests. Um, really amazing stuff that's going on out there. The other thing is, like, when we talk about healthy aging, so much of this is about uh, things like muscle balance, flexibility. You know, old people, they fall down, they break their hip. Um, they lose their balance. They lose their flexibility. It just happens. And, and if you can uh, keep your muscle, now as you know, uh, in your 50s and very much in your 60s and beyond, adding muscle is incredibly difficult. It's actually thought to be impossible, but it isn't. Um, there are some things called peptides that you can um, inject subcutaneously, which are types of amino acids that actually can allow uh, that can generate growth hormones uh, mm. and allow muscles to grow at any age. So it goes on and on and on. But guess what, my friends? You're never going to hear this from your neighborhood doctor because the truth is your neighborhood doctor, hear me on this, is thinking the way that Ezekiel Emmanuel is thinking, which is I'll do whatever I can for you at 70 or 75, but I'm not expecting you to really live much longer. So I'm not going to I'm not giving you all my best time and best work because you're on your way to your grave. <laughs> that is the way that it's a different paradigm. Out. It's a totally, 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 totally different paradigm, but it's the paradigm. It's the way that people are going to be thinking five, 10 years from now, normally every day. But guess what? I don't have five years. I don't have 10 years. And what we think at the Da Vinci 50 is very simple, which is if the risk is low and the potential reward is high, then 
you should have a propensity to action. Take the tiny risk for the big reward. And the doctor will not even take that tiny risk because of liability. But you are the CEO of your own health and you have to make those decisions and not subcontract it to your medical professional who at the end of the day is nothing more than a consultant. Mm. So for like instance, for a calcium score type of thing, would you ask your doctor to administer it? I would ask them to write Mm. me a script because it can Mm. be done at any radiology center. Um, And most doctors will do it upon request. They may go, oh, you know, I don't know. You know, it's not FDA approved, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, hey, you know, just do me a solid and and cut me a script on this. I just want to know I have plaque I'm going to drop dead. Just sign the script. Right, (laughs) right. But when you learn like, oh, the president gets it done and chief executives get it done, do you think they'd really do that if there was nothing to it? Right. So we know the president has a calcium score of 130 or 140 because his personal physician revealed that a few days ago. Hmm. Um, So he does have some early or some, I should call it mild heart disease. Um, There would be no way to know that for sure unless he had actually gotten the scan. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to emphasize to your, to your viewers and listeners, that this is not perfect science. You could have a, a, a score of zero and still have a heart attack because other elements but it tells you that things are good things are it's good. just one measurement in in the whole graph right i mean but it, it's better than zero measurements in the whole graph absolutely and we could go on and on in terms of things that people don't pay attention to like bettering their glucose control and their blood pressure yeah i wanted to ask but, you about the dietary things you know we've talked about your thoughts on intermittent fasting and other things what do you what have you seen oh intermittent fasting is fantastic i mean it's the real deal um there's tremendous science behind it going back many years and just to describe what that means um to your viewership Uh, This means that you only eat during a limited number of hours. So, for example, you might say, well, I'm only going to eat between 1 and 8, or I'm only going to eat between 10 and 7, right? So that you have a long period of time where you're quote-unquote fasting. Now, you have people that are... that that are much more intense about it. I have a friend that only eats in a four-hour, I think, or a three-hour uh, time span. And then you have folks like my wife who actually doesn't even get hungry until the mid-afternoon. So it's no big deal at all for her to um, be intermittent fasting for 16, 15 hours a day. Well, guess what? She's losing weight. And um, she's also helping in terms of um, all of all of her the things that that helps yeah. like um the, the, one of the biggest is inflammation i mean people get right. scared off by that term intermittent fasting it's very simple it's just you're right. eating within a des- like you said a 7 or 8 hour period you're fasting quote unquote for a 16 hour period have you seen or heard um what's optimal like you said oh my there's a friend who does eats within a 3 or 4 hour period is that healthier or not as healthy you know, that, that can put a strain yeah. on certain things too. I imagine like we had talked about, it could put a strain on the kidneys and other organs. So I don't know if you've seen like, okay, let's say I can choose any span, even if it's two hours, what would be the optimal? And right, everyone's going to be right. different. What would right. be the optimal? Um, t- I've never heard, really heard that many people talking about it. I hear more, okay, you just eat within an eight hour period, fast for 16, but I've always thought, well, what if I'm only eating for a four-hour period? Is that better? I don't know. Right. Well, um, and this would probably be a great time to reemphasize to the whole viewership, do not do any of this without seeking medical, um, with your own- Without joining the Da Vinci 50. No, I'm just- Well, yeah, without without getting a medical professional to sign off on it, because there are people who shouldn't be doing this at all. And you just mentioned people with kidney disease. That would be a great example. But for folks that are in generally good health, one of the most important concerns is what can I actually do every day consistently? It's not what can I do, you know, like occasionally. But like what my wife discovered was, you know what, I can actually start eating at four and end at eight or nine. And I can do that and there's absolutely no... She has no problem with it. Yeah, and it's not interfering socially, right? 
And if it, and it's not, and listen, folks, if you're out one day for brunch, go for it, right? It doesn't have to be every single day. As, as one of my doctors said, be religious, but don't be fanatical. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it's what you do 85% of the time that's going to make the difference, not what you do 100% yeah. of the time. Yeah. Uh, but I, to me, my way of thinking, like, uh, you know, if you were to eat simply um, like uh, one to eight or one to seven, you'd be, it would already be a really shape. good thing. Yeah. Yeah. If you could make it maybe three to seven, that would be even better. But listen, if you just skip breakfast and start at lunch um, and then don't snack after dinner, you are already doing amazing things that most no one else is doing. And by the way, again, it's not theoretical. You'll be able to see the actual results on your blood work. Your C-reactive protein will go down. Your glucose will go down. All your numbers will start to improve. You'll see it with your own two eyes. Richard, I can do this for another three hours. I know you're busy. So I just want to thank you. Be the first one to thank you. And this has been tremendous, phenomenal. Um, I always always learn from you. Um, and where should we point people towards? We can tell them to check out the Da Vinci, uh, five zero V and then D A V I N C I 50.com. Uh, where else is there anywhere else we should point people towards? No, I've got um, a little video there that talks about it. And then I also um, have um, a little webinar there where I go on for 30 minutes about things that you can do right now. But the fact is, I I guess the most important thing I want to leave everyone with is the times they are are changing. We are at the cusp right now of of a moment where I believe with all my heart um, and really, really brilliant people also believe that we can uh, and will be able to cure chronic diseases and extend vibrant life in our time, in our, in our lifetime, right? So the first rule is don't die. The second rule is to the best of your ability, don't get sick. Because it's, even if you aren't in the Da Vinci 50, even if you aren't at the very front of the line like we are, it's coming. And it's coming really, really fast. Um, and you, you want to just be sure you're on red alert for all of this as it becomes available. Hmm. Thank you, Richard. Fantastic. It's a joy. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Totally. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 